Uh, when uh, the organizers asked me to to give this uh, to give a talk in this seminar, I uh, told them that I have no new results or maybe no old results even in number theory. And uh, uh, yeah, that uh, like I, I can talk about some uh, general topics in uh, my field of interest in complexity theory. And uh, yeah, they said that that would be great. So good. So I'll uh, I'll talk about randomness, which is one of my favorite. Uh, topics. I want to talk about this. Uh, 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 you know, randomness is, is something that I guess uh, mankind was always interested in, and it's a topic you can talk uh, to almost everyone on the street about uh, luck and chance and unpredictability, and uh, uh, um, you know, informally. Uh, but you can, you know, mathematicians study the randomness in in variety of forms in uh, in probability and uh, statistics and so on. And uh, um, uh, then uh, physicists are extremely curious about randomness and the meaning of randomness and uh, a lot of uh, scientific interest in in randomness. So it's a very very broad topic, and people have uh, sometimes very strong opinions about. Uh, randomness and its meaning and so on. So what I want to tell you about today is this, uh, you know, computational complexity point of view uh, of randomness. And uh, of course, the, this is a very general, high-level, non-technical talk. It will be a lot of things uh, you'll see you you would have known. Or uh, what is what is uh, I want I would like to stress is a new conceptual element. So. There'll be lots of examples, and uh, I'll tell you when uh, you know something new is coming uh, of importance. Okay, so what's uh, now is okay. Um, the plan is uh, first of all, I'm going to talk only about discrete events uh, for number theories, is, is uh, usually okay. Uh, so what's perfect randomness for me? Perfect, uh, the perfect random event will be, you know, uh, uh, a coin toss, uh, something that has probability of heads and tails equal a half. And if there are many of them, they're independent. So I always show this slide, which of the, these two sequences of 20 letters is more probable. I know you know the answer. They're equally probable. So. That is what we would call the uniform distribution or the distribution with full entropy. This will be like our ideal model of randomness, perfect randomness. And uh, you know, for the first uh, 15 minutes or so, I'll just go through examples of uh, different uh, applications, you can call them, or ways in which randomness is used. Uh, places it is used, and uh, you know the the main thing in the back of our mind should be, uh, you know, can we really do that? I mean, I mean, what you know, what do we do if we don't have perfect independence? Can any of them be done without it? And uh, in order to understand this, we'll move to define pseudo randomness, uh, which, roughly speaking, uh, is just a you know you can think of collectively uh, deterministic structures that share some properties with random ones, some properties. And we'll talk about different such properties. And that will help us uh, you know, understand that. We'll see many examples. And, uh, and then uh, I will go back to the basic question of what can we do in a world in which there is no perfect randomness. Maybe there is weak randomness or no randomness. And we'll roughly discuss the meaning of this, all pretty informally. Uh, of course, underlying the, the you know these the main messages are formal theorems that prove them. That uh, you can quiz me about that. Okay, so um, let me start uh, with the utility of uh, randomness. And uh, as I said, the back of our mind, with every, you'll see this icon in every slide. You know, you can ask yourself, or maybe you have asked yourself, where are the random bits for this coming from? And we'll discuss that later. Okay, so the most basic example that everybody gives to the power of randomness is just sampling. Uh, you want to know what the, you know what will be the uh, fraction of people who will, will vote red in a particular country. Yeah, you just uh, even if it's huge, it's millions of people. 
if you sample 2,000 at random, but completely at random, a perfect subset of 2,000 at random, then you know that with probability at least 99% over this choice, the percentage of uh, red votes in the sample and the red votes in the population will be within 2% of the actual uh, percentage. And this is also, you know, we know it's hugely powerful. Uh, first of all, we know that, uh, you know, that uh, these, uh, these numbers, uh, two and one percent, don't depend on the size of the population, right? That's basically the law of large numbers. It's a very powerful way of uh, using randomness. And of course, the main point is that if we didn't have randomness here, um, you know, it's not clear how you get even an estimate up to two percent without asking 98 percent of the population what they think. So that's a very, very strong demonstration. And I want to move to uh, less obvious ones. Um, uh, here's one. Uh, I give you this uh, portion of the plane, uh, the proportion of the grid. And I ask you, in how many ways can you tile it with dominoes? You don't have to look at the colors here. Just in how many ways can you tile this region with dominoes? Can be this rectangular region. It could be uh, any other other region. And uh, this is a basic question, the basic counting question. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it doesn't come out of uh, uh, nowhere. I mean, it's picturesque, but it's also important. It's called the Dimer problem in physics. And uh, for diatomic molecules, it captures the thermal dynamic properties of that um, matter, uh, you know, it, it can understand from it uh, free energy, phase transitions and stuff like that. So it's also an important problem. But uh, the main problem is that, that there can be, even the region is small, it's a thousand by a thousand, the number of such configurations can be used. Uh, and uh, here's a very important result uh, from about 20 years ago, Jerome Sinclair and Vigoda. Uh, they found a way to approximately count the number of domino tilings in any region. In fact, it's more general. It's the number of matchings in any graph. Um, doesn't have to be planar. Uh, the type of algorithm, I'm not going to describe algorithms, but the nature of it is, uh, some people know, it's um, uh, what's called the Monte Carlo method. The, the number of matchings can be exponential in the size of the region, so the size of the graph. So you cannot just write it down or uh, look at all of them. The, there's a sort of Markov chain analyzing this. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, figuring out that this uh, Markov chain con converges quickly is highly non-trivial. And uh, that gives a probabilistic algorithm for this problem for approximately counting the number. We know that counting exactly the number is a difficult problem and I will not go into this. So. This approximation problem can be done fast probabilistically, but the best deterministic algorithm known uh, requires exponential time. You know, we can't do really better than just trying all possibilities and uh, adding them up. So I want to stress that this is the best known deterministic algorithm. There may be faster ones that we haven't discovered yet. And actually we'll see at the end that maybe there is a faster one. Okay. so. There are many, many uh, such examples, and this is really the key application that I want to uh, eventually discuss. You know, what can we do you know, of randomness, namely to probabilistic algorithm, understanding the power of randomness in algorithms, in computation. Um, many examples, uh, you know, many of them, they are all over mathematics, uh, in every field of mathematics. In number theory, uh, the problem of finding large primes, you know, just give me a thousand bit prime, thousand digit prime. Uh, we don't know any deterministic way to do that. We can certify primality quickly by now, but uh, we don't know how to just, you know, find a number, uh, a large number, which is prime deterministically. Uh, factoring multivariate polynomials uh, over finite fields, it's another, Example, approximating the volume of a convex sets in high dimensions, um, computing large Fourier coefficients of multivariate functions that are given by, by program, say, by circuit. 
in all of these things, uh, in all these cases, uh, and there are many more examples, they are fast probabilistic algorithms. In many cases, they are highly non-trivial. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the best known deterministic algorithm for each of them requires exponential time. So we'd like to know whether they are deterministic ones or not. Sorry, Avi, can I ask, uh, yes. for finding a large prime, why don't you just start, you know, if you want to find a prime above n, you yes. start at n, and then you use, we know the prime is in p, Yeah. so you check if n is a prime, then you check if n plus 1 is a prime, and by the prime number theorem, you should take you log n steps before you find one. If you believe the prime, if you, no, no, it, it will not take you log n. I mean, the best we know is root n, or something like that. We don't know that there is a prime. You need but Kramer. The prime number yeah. theorem does not guarantee that every interval of log n is a prime. I mean, the, the gaps between the primes. Okay, so that part of it is still probabilistic, even exactly. if I can check yeah. that the so, number is. Yeah, yeah. We don't know. I mean, any, any advance on any of these questions would be extremely interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, just see. I mean, there was a large project in this. Uh, um, uh, I forgot what the you know the last. Only Only. Sorry, polymath. Yeah, polymath uh, projects that uh, Tim Gauss and uh, Terry Tao organized some ten years ago, uh, just focused on this particular problem, finding large primes. And uh, yeah, this was one of the polymath failures. I mean, I, I think it was really interesting what went on there. But anyway, yeah. So, but it's good to just stress that you know, it's uh, when we you say n large n, we mean like a thousand digits so a number with uh, which starts with uh, let's say a one and then has some uh a thousand digits after it and is prime find one deterministically uh yeah Sorry, but, i'll oh. just interrupt for a second i mean in practice you can find large primes very quickly because we know that you don't have to go very far to find a prime it's the <laughs> thing is that there's no practice here. i want a theorem yeah Andrew. i want a theorem <laughs> Yeah, no, but just as along yeah. Alex's. Uh, yeah, there are lots of heuristics yeah. for lots of problems, and uh, uh, you know, but uh, yeah. They, but anyway, these are just examples. It's just. Uh, I mean, of course, no, no kind of... surprise. No surprise that you are interested in this one, but uh, you know, I think it's a good challenge for number theory. It's, it's a really interesting one. Of course, sir, we have a, an, a, an algorithm that is deterministic that is conjecture to to work very rapidly, but we cannot prove that. Yeah, well, this is the only question. I want something provable. I want a theorem. So in all these cases, you know, the probabilistic algorithm will uh, uh, guarantee to find with the 99 probability a prime, and it will certify that. And we want to do it without randomness. Can we do it? And let's stop the discussion of this. Uh, sorry, I make progress. But uh, yeah, it's a great problem, uh, this particular one. Uh, OK, good. So these were examples of probabilistic algorithms. I want to give you examples of just some other things where randomness uh, is used uh, of a different nature, uh, uh, several one, several such examples. Um, distributed computation, uh, randomness can make uh, not just an exponential improvement in time, but uh, an infinite one in, uh, in that they can make some problems that are provably impossible become possible with randomness. These are two uh, picturesque examples of fundamental problems in distributed computing. One is the dining philosopher's problem. The second is the Byzantine general's problem. As you can tell, these guys know how to pick names for their problems. Um, uh, you know, so in both cases, I will not explain this. Uh, it's, it's a bit besides the uh, main course of uh, the lecture, but I want to stress that these are fundamental problems in distributed computation, in asynchronous distributed computation. One is about consensus and one is about coordination. And the uh, theorems that there is no deterministic uh, solution, whatever that means, I didn't define it. But if the, the actors in this distributed system have randomness, then uh, you know, it's possible to solve them. And in fact, the, this randomness, you know, these algorithms are used. So here the gap can be arbitrary between randomness and determinism, and that's provable. So we will not talk about uh, you know, applications here, but uh, another demonstration. Uh, here's another one that uh, 
goes even beyond the you, know, you can think that randomness helps to do things it also helps to define things um, uh, in game theory uh, you know which is supposed to model rational behavior we try to understand in strategic situations what would actors players agents do here's a very simple example from a, you know, a game of uh, Auman uh, called the chicken game uh, which is uh, yeah, as, as uh, often done in uh, uh, game theory represented by a matrix of payoffs uh, for two players in this you can imagine that uh, uh, this game represents two uh, sort of macho drivers uh, driving towards each other on a narrow road and they can either you know each of them can either their sway to the side or continue <laughs> continue to drive and uh, like being cautious or aggressive and uh, the payoffs to each of them are written here where you can see in the bottom right that if they are both aggressive then they no no one deviates they both basically die uh, so but anyway you ask what what would players do in such a situation uh what would be a rational behavior and as i'm sure you most of you know uh there's a you know a key concept uh, that uh, john nash defines the nash equilibrium you want uh, a strategy for each uh, pair of strategies uh, such that given the other one you would not change yours so it's kind of a stability requirement on a um on a solution concept okay and uh, it's a very natural one to choose. And uh, uh, of course, Nash didn't get the Nobel Prize just for the definition. He also had the theorem is that every game, every strategic game of this nature, uh, no matter how many players, no matter how many strategies, there is always such a solution. This solution concept is universal. It always exists. What is interesting and important for us is that, as again, as many of you know, this depends on the ability of uh, players to toss coins. So the, the strategies they will choose, the strategies that, that exist are mixed strategies, namely the random strategies. In this particular game, there's a unique such uh, equilibrium where, you know, the, with these numbers, it happens to me uh, to be cautious with probability three quarters and aggressive with probability one quarter if you know you know that the other driver behaves like this you would stay with the, your choice anyway uh the main point here is that in if you require or you don't allow them randomness if they are deterministic there is no you know there is no equilibrium so here's another uh, place so there are several points here uh, uh this is something that exists with randomness and does not exist without randomness another is that you know you can ask yourself uh, uh you know here it's really important i mean are people in life in economic situations speaking strategies like this and are they using randomness and so on anyway but that's just another example a example closer to uh computer science and to life of everybody is cryptography uh where where uh, randomness is basically you know you can't leave home without it everything depends on it uh the very definition of a secret needs randomness i mean if you you know shannon already pointed out that uh, uh formalized using his uh, notion of entropy and so on uh a secret is basically as good as entropy in it i mean if you pick your um nine is password randomly then my chances of guessing it is exactly you know one in ten to the nine if on the other hand you you pick it as a phone number of one of your uh, friends then i probably have a better chance of guessing it it would have much less entropy uh, but then of course random is absolutely essential to any notion we define in uh, cryptography uh, basically everything and uh, also there and this is something that's practically used all the time uh, you can ask yourself what uh, you know what randomness is used there and is it perfect as the you know the definitions all assume 
uh, perfect randomness, like the probabilistic algorithm for let's assume perfect randomness. Uh, where is it coming from? Yeah, randomness is used in lots of other places, of course, and also there you may wonder where is the, the random bits coming from in the casino, uh, and so on. So that's about the set of examples I wanted to talk about, and uh, it's clear that randomness is an essential part of lots of uh, lots of our lives. So now I want to ask uh, the question, uh, you know, we, we asked before, where are these random bits coming from? Let's say in particular applications that we have seen. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, when I don't know the answer to a question, I uh, ask Google. I'm sure you do many times. So, you know, you feed Google, you know, two random bits. What do you get? Well. 10 years ago, uh, when this slide is formed, I got 4 million answers. Probably today there will be uh, 400 million answers. Uh, but you stare at the, you know, you know, the, the answer more or less is basically you buy them. <laughs> you want good random bits, you buy them. Uh, at least there are lots of companies that will sell you a random bit. And then uh, you can ask yourself, well, <laughs> Where do they take their random bits from? And uh, okay, well, you can read what they say. I mean, some take it from various physical uh, um, you know, phenomena, uh, which is interesting because they seem somewhat unpredictable. Uh, some take them from yeah, other physical phenomena, which are maybe more unpredictable, like uh, quantum behavior. Uh, if you wonder about casinos, at least some years ago, there was uh, there were we're all using uh, this chip of this company, and you can wonder whether it works or not. I mean, whether what they are doing does generate random bits or random in what sense. Anyway, we would like to understand this question: What is the uh, you know what is randomness? In fact, what is uh, randomness to any particular purpose that randomness is used? And uh, so now, uh, I really want to to come to a central uh, definition. And uh, yeah, this uh, time to to uh, that the next slide is maybe the most important slide of the talk. Um, we are trying to define or understand uh, how to define the uh, randomness. So this is taken from a fundamental paper of Blum and Nicali from the early '80s, and. Uh, uh, here I uh, invite Alina to unmute herself and join me. It's okay, Alina. Alina, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> All right, yes. Enthusiastic, as I can see. Um, okay, so so uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, sort of do an experiment. Uh, we are trying to understand. We said that the you know the. Uh, post typical random event is a coin toss, uh, half tails, half heads. So suppose uh, I'm holding a coin and I'm going to toss it uh, in the air. Oops. Okay. Uh, I'll toss the coin and you know you should guess uh, just as it leaves my finger. Uh, so maybe it's, uh, yeah, we, we <laughs> assume we are in the same room, let's say. Uh, as in the picture, you are watch, you are watching me, and uh, you know maybe it spends two seconds in the air, and you should guess uh, just as it, as it leaves my finger whether it will be heads or tails when it lands on the floor. Okay, what do you think the probability that uh, you'll predict it correctly will be? Uh -huh. Good. I told you not to worry. Um, Good. Okay. So yeah, I agree, and I think most people will give this answer. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me ask you another question. Suppose uh, you know you are holding a laptop. In fact, I know you have a laptop uh, <laughs> that you are watching. You can use it. So uh, you know, as I uh, currently my finger, you know, you, are, you you can do whatever you want. Uh, what do you think is the probability that you will uh, predict it correctly? Okay, we are in agreement. And again, I think everybody will have the same view. Um, okay, and uh, so now let's change it again. And suppose uh, I uh, I give you you know uh, any number of video cameras that are trained on my uh, on my fingers, and uh, they are all connected to a quake 
computer and the supercomputer and it is connected to your laptop and they are all ready to go just as I, I toss the coin. Uh, what do you think will be the chances that you predict the, the outcome correctly? Well, depends how well positioned that the It's as powerful as you want. Uh, <laughs> it's as powerful it, it gets, and... I guess, closer to one, right? Yeah, I wow, I, I think the right person. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, so what's the point about this? Again, I think that, uh, yeah, you can imagine that, you know, with sufficient machinery, um, the uh one can calculate uh, you know the angular momentum of the coin and the uh, and the, you know the air pressure and the humidity in the air and the distance to the floor with perfect accuracy so that almost surely uh, you'll get the right answer certainly in far less than two seconds okay so what is the point of this there's a there's a major point here which deviates from all previous views of randomness I want to stress that the experiment, me tossing the coin, the, the random event, supposedly random event, the event anyway we are using didn't change. My behavior didn't change here. I'm tossing the coin, I'm the random generator. I didn't change at all, right? This is the point. So it's what, what is happening is we are seeing a property of randomness that distinguishes between different observers of the random phenomena, right? Depends, you know, randomness somehow, I mean, the ability to predict how much entropy is in the coin depends on the, well, maybe not the eye of the beholder, but the computational power of the beholder. Okay, so this is very different than, uh, you know, basically, every prior point of view till the, I know, the 80s. Uh, it's an objective definition. Uh, sorry, so it's, and, uh, sorry, it's uh, unlike the previous objective definition of, of randomness, this is a subjective one. It depends on the observer and it's operative. You know, so it's, uh, you know, we look at the, what the <clears throat> observer would say or what's the probability that the observer will say something about what they see. Okay, so we are going to take now this, uh, you know, point of view and are going to study pseudo-randomness or notions, various notions of pseudo-randomness because they too will depend on observers or on properties of events that are being looked at. So I'm switching now to the second part and if there's a, you know, important question or somebody in the chat that uh, Philip uh, saw that uh, is, uh, you know, I need to answer now, I'm happy to. Um, so I'll just repeat the message is that we are now considering randomness as a property of the observer. How much randomness, how much entropy, or what is what is what we will call random uh, depends on observers or on properties of what we are seeing. Okay, so let me just start giving examples. So now I'm moving to the second part, and this is about pseudo randomness. And uh, I'll, this slide is a bit abstract, and then there will be many examples. So don't worry if this is a bit abstract, but anyway, it should be appealing still. Uh, we are looking now at deterministic structure. So imagine there's a universe of objects, these objects can be you know, of any type, there can be numbers, graphs, sequences, uh, tables, works, and codes, and so on. Lots of uh, possibilities, but uh, discrete ones. And uh, in it, uh, we want to understand what is the random-like behavior or a typical behavior. And uh, it will, I'll call it a property, and uh, this property will be just a subset of this universe. And the definition will be really simple. A pseudo-random property is any large property, any property, any subset that occupies most of the universe. So think of a hay in a, you know, um, <clears throat> in a haystack. So, second. So a property that's held by most elements of the universe. Equivalently, 
it's like the hay in a haystack or you know another way to think about it is if you pick a random element from you it satisfies this property so this i will call and for the you know these examples that will follow this will be for me a pseudo random property I want to stress that both math and CS have lots of questions about pseudo-randomness, and we'll see them. The typical such question in, in mathematics is whether a particular object has a pseudo-random property, which is defined. Uh, so we study, you know, random-like properties of natural objects. This X0 may be natural. We'll see examples. In computer science, it's a different angle, uh, mostly, uh we look you know we we want an algorithm to find any uh element of this uh, uh with this property so basically we are looking for finding objects that have random like properties we know that most of them are like that so it's like sort of searching for hay in a haystack and uh, you know as we'll see i mean this is not an easy task despite uh, you know the popular culture we are not looking for needles, we are looking for hay. Okay, so let's see examples and uh, you know, you'll get familiar to my terminology here. Uh, first, I want to say just why, you know, it, yeah, the popular culture does uh, say that we should uh, easily find hay in haystack. Why, why is this not true in the, in the problems we are really interested in? First of all, that, uh, you know, uh, we are talking about huge objects, and uh, typically we see very, very tiny parts of them. So we may see closer to us, maybe needles. Uh, and we are also often tend to search, you know, sort of using the tools we have, and that they may not be sufficient. I just want to give two sort of popular examples. You know, we may look at the, uh, uh, this and say, oh, this is green everywhere even though we know most of it is red, uh, but we have to cut it first. And another example is uh, that I like a lot uh, is this uh, issue of exoplanets. I mean, for uh, up to about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, I think people had no evidence that uh, other stars, which are of course suns uh, in the universe have any planets. There was no way to see them. You needed the particular new techniques. So, you could have predicted that you know no no suns have planets except maybe ours, uh, but it's not true. Okay, so sometimes uh, you know uh, we don't we don't uh, these are huge objects and we may not have the right tools. So let let's see you know more mathematical examples. Uh, let me start with codes because uh, most people are familiar with them. Of course, codes are extremely error correcting codes are extremely important to you know lots of things we use in our daily lives and uh, embedded in all of the storage and communication devices are, are uh, good error correcting codes uh, they have you know large rates and distance if you want that you know there's a formal definition of what a good code what the properties of a good code is but uh, you know let's fix some such notion uh, the basic result that Shannon, you know, opened the door for uh, this uh, amazing theory, causing theory, was the, first of all, the observation that a random code is a good code. Almost all codes are good codes. I'm not defining formally the, the space and so on, but uh, some of you know and some of you can imagine, but regardless, a random code is a good code. And the first thing I want to take from this is to, you know, instill in you that uh, you know my notation this that means that good codes uh, is a being a good code is a pseudo random property why because it you know almost every code is good okay that's one point and then what do you want to do if you want to put it in various devices you need to be also useful you want to be able to describe it decode and code it decode it and so on and this is a hard problem i mean that it took uh, you know some 20 years and we are still looking for other, you know, even better ones. But to find explicit codes, you know, uh, efficiently usable codes, this, uh, this is a hard problem. So this is an example of problem, uh, you know, uh, of uh, finding a, a, an element of a pseudo-random property. 
Here's a very different element, uh, a, a very different example. I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar with this number. Uh, so here is a, you know, a property that you would like uh, maybe this random to satisfy or is believed to be a property of pi. If you look at the number of occurrences of the digit seven uh, in the expansion of pi, it looks like uh, it appears about one tenth of the time. If you look at any pair of digits, let's say 54, 0.654 occurs one hundredth of the time. If you look at any triple, one thousandth of the time, et cetera. So let's demand that. Let's say we, we, we are looking at real numbers, maybe between zero and one, and we want uh, all these properties. It's a count countable number of properties. We want them to hold about this real number. And moreover, we want them to hold not only in base 10, but in base seven, in base 15, in base million and one, and so on. Still a counter, counter, countable number of properties. Uh, and uh, what do we know about this? Uh, well, these are called normal numbers, uh, properties uh, and numbers satisfying all these properties are called normal. And uh, it's basically an observation uh, that uh, just because they are only countable in many conditions, uh, that a random real number, let's say between real and uh, between zero and one, is normal with high probability, and, you know, except with probability zero. Uh, so again, this means that normality is a pseudo random property. It is held by almost every number in the universe we pick. And uh, yeah, mathematicians study this uh, question. It's, uh, you know, for example, particular natural elements like pi, like root two or e or whatever are normal. And I should stress, this is, uh, these problems are still open. Maybe some of you are working on them, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so the open problems in, uh, you know, that are formulated, naturally formulated in this language of randomness, give me, Give me an object that looks like a random object. Here in the, the uh, pseudo random property is normality. So, this uh, may be uh, you know, not a central example in, in mathematics, but uh, I want to say that the problems that can be expressed in exactly this form, you know, is a natural object, pseudo random, are absolutely fundamental in both math and uh, computer science. And I want to give you another example, which you you particularly will know number theorists. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, the major problems uh, that concern or can be phrased at uh, questions about pseudo randomness. And uh, usually, if I have a room, uh, I'm talking to and can see people, I ask the uh, young ones, you know, what are major problems? How do you know that the problem is major? Uh, well, one, one uh, answer is that uh, there's a lot of uh, bounty money offered for it. So here's one set of such uh, problems, uh, the clay millennium problems. Um, and uh, yeah, one is gone. Uh, there's still other ways to make a million dollars. What I want to say is that at least two of these problems are really naturally expressed as uh, questions about pseudo randomness, uh, the, you know, our main problem, computer science, and you know, maybe your main problem, the Riemann hypothesis. I will not spend much time about this uh, first one, p versus n p, but say briefly, why is it uh, a pseudo randomness question? Well, what's a pseudo random property? Being hard to compute is a pseudo random property. Random functions are hard to compute, and we ask whether a particular function, let's say the traveling salesman problem or, uh, you know, solving, you know, quadratic uh, systems of quadratic equations of a finite field, your favorite, whether a particular problem, natural problem is also how to compute. That's basically the previous empty question. So it's a question about pseudo randomness, whether a natural element has a pseudo random property. And uh, I want to talk about the second one. I'll elaborate on this. I don't need to read it. Uh, but again, uh, we'll see a pseudo random property. And uh, yeah, many of you, of course, will know this uh, result. So let's express the Riemann hypothesis as a pseudo random property of something. 
And this something will be, uh, you know, the universe will be a collection, collection, collection of walks. So here's a you know, canonical description of the drunkard walk. Uh, you think that there is a, a pub in uh, location zero in this uh, uh, street, if you want, uh, and somebody walks into it. And after a few beers come out and uh, start walking up and down the street, maybe a bit drunk. So takes each step up with probability half and uh, down with probability half. Um, and then you can, you know, just run an experiment just uh, and uh, toss random coins and see where uh, the person gets to after a hundred steps. And even if you didn't know math, uh, you you observe immediately that something weird happened that despite the fact that the person took, uh, you know, a hundred steps, uh, he or she would be only about 10 paces away from the pub. So something happens, which we know. Uh, and of course, it's, a, it's an exercise to prove that after n steps, almost surely with very high probability, the distance from the origin will be about four ten steps. So uh, it's an exercise, of course. And uh, more important for me, it's a something uh, we see a pseudo random property here, right? So uh, the property of a walk staying close to the origin, about root n from the origin, is a pseudo random property because almost every walk has this property. Okay, good. So now let's talk about the particular walk, which you all like, the Mebius walk. Um, you know, so here's the definition, you know, for an integer p of x, you know, the number of distinct prime divisors. Uh, and we just define mu of x, a Mebius function. Uh, it will be zero if the x has a square divisor and otherwise, uh, you know, it's, oops, there's a minus one hidden. Uh, yeah, so it's minus one if it's odd. I wonder if I can fix this so that it will be visible. Ah, here is the minus. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, anyway, that's a Mebius function and maybe a function you can think of it as describing your walk. I mean, it just uh, tells you for every time step, uh, first step, second step, third step, what to do, whether to go up the street or down the street. And let's suppose we allow also that sometimes you stay where you are. So I'm changing a bit the definition of a walk, but that doesn't matter much. And now uh, what are we wondering about? Is this particular walk, it's just a description of a walk like before, but only it's deterministic, not random. And we ask whether it's, uh, you know, has this pseudo random property? Does it stay close to the origin? And as, you know, probably most of you in this audience know, uh, that's basically the Riemann hypothesis, right? Uh, if for every, and this, this work stays around the origin, then the Riemann hypothesis is true and vice versa. So it's another formulation, a very convenient, uh, formulation than one that you can tell your, you know, your family and friends about without zeta functions about what the Riemann hypothesis really is. So, but anyway, very conveniently stated as a um, pseudo random, as a question about the particular pseudo random property. Okay, so uh, these are basically the examples, we see one more soon, but I want to get now to the point I was uh, uh, talking about in the beginning. Uh, how does this uh, point of view, uh, what did it lead us to understand about uh, applications of randomness, you know, to especially to probabilistic algorithms and uh, um, some major results, uh, both technically and conceptually, uh, understanding uh, some fundamental truth about uh, the power and limitation of randomness, at least in computational setting. Okay, and, and actually quite beyond, but I will probably not have time to talk about this. Um, okay, so let me summarize this on one slide and uh, I'll elaborate a bit on one. So 
the three possible worlds I want to consider are the following. One is the world in which we have perfect randomness in which we could uh, you know, do everything we want. We just are guaranteed a stream of unbiased independent coin toss. The second world is a world that was maybe uh, alluded to by some of the companies that use physical devices to, or physical phenomena to create uh, um, random bits or pseudo random bits. This is a world where uh, we have some unpredictable phenomena. You can think of sunspots or stock market behavior or radioactive decay or quantum phenomena, your favorite. Uh, in each of them, uh, we we feel there's some entropy. We feel there's some unpredictability. If we want to know, you know, of course, they are not independent events. Uh, if you want to know the weather tomorrow, it's probably a good guess to say that it will be like today. So they are correlated, um, and uh, uh, they are not. Uh, they are some, sometimes biased, and so on. Of course, we can manipulate them and uh, try to use them then in one of these applications. Anyway, this is a world in which there's some entropy in the in the sequence we see, but it's not necessarily independent, unbiased, you know, uniform distribution. And the third world is, uh, you know, there's the, uh, the world is deterministic. There is no randomness at all. It's all in our imagination. Everything's predictable. What can we do then? It's uh, we can we just uh, everything is deterministic. So, yeah. You know, uh, we saw these applications in, in case we have perfect randomness. There's a question what survives uh, otherwise? Uh, and are in the next two boxes are really major, these major understandings. So, in the first, it turns out that all probabilistic algorithms can be made to function as they did, even in the presence of very weak randomness. Uh, this is the subject of what uh, is called extractor theory, randomness extraction, a uh, long, long sequence of works. And uh, it is all about purifying randomness, taking uh, you know, weak random sources, sources that are biased and dependent, and somehow extracting all the, or extracting anyway, uh, their entropy in pure form. They may made to look maybe shorter sequences, but they look like they were perfectly random. So that's one uh you know one theory one major result uh sequence of results uh, the second one is what happens if the world is deterministic and in this case we just don't know uh how to move an inch without an assumption but it's okay the assumption is something that we uh live with it's uh and believe uh, so I want to assume, I put it in quotes because I don't want to formally define it. Uh, well, you can ask me, but, uh, uh, but something like P is different than NP. Uh, you can satisfy yourself at least in uh, that, that uh, the whole electronic commerce world uh, you live in uh, assumes far less than that, right? It assumes that factoring or discrete logarithm or some other computational problem in NP is difficult, it's exponentially difficult. And that's the nature of the assumption that we need. Okay, so we assume something like uh, there exists a house function. That's what we assume. And now under this assumption, again, uh, you know, we don't need randomness. All fast algorithms for, with, for every practical purposes are all algorithms. Fast, I mean those we can run in our lifetime. So all efficient algorithms that are probabilistic can be replaced. Let's say every fast probabilistic algorithm has a deterministic counterpart. There's another algorithm which is deterministic, does exactly the same thing, has no error, uh, and is not much slower than the original. This is a consequence of another theory, which uh, you know, sort of the paradigm underlying it, underlying it is uh, hardness versus randomness paradigm, namely you can use hard function to generate good enough randomness deterministically. Again, long sequence of work, several decades span, and uh, uh, the consequence is this understanding. So in other words, it seems like, you know, randomness for the purpose of algorithms is far uh, weaker than 
uh, may have been suspected initially with the, you know, their power or the seeming success in the absence of deterministic algorithms for lots of problems we want to solve. Okay. Uh, I want to say something about, let's see how I'm doing with time. I just give a hint. Okay, good. So I started uh, seven minutes late, so that's good. Uh, yeah, it will take uh, five more minutes of your time. Um, I want to tell you something about this extractor theory and randomness purification. And uh, yeah, we saw that you know, perfect randomness has lots of application. And suppose in reality, we have, uh, you know, these uh, sort of weak random sources, these bias dependent sources. And uh, I want to assume for this, uh, you know, this is only part of the story. Uh, I want to assume that uh, the, uh, there are several of them and they are independent of each other. So let's say we have three or five or 10 such phenomena that we can tap. They are all weak, you know, they, they all contain maybe you know, uh, an n bit sequence will contain only n over 100 bits of entropy or maybe square root n of bits of entropy. Uh, but, but I have several of them. So I want to assume that, you know, sunspots don't affect stock market behavior. Uh, some people believe that it does actually, but uh, let's assume it's not. So I have several sources. Of, and the question is, if I have such a, you know, uh, collection of uh, outputs of such phenomena, can I transform it into maybe a shorter sequence of something that looks, you know, exactly or almost exactly, statistically exactly like the uniform distribution? That's the subject of extractor theory. And I want to give you a hint into one result that, you know, uses a pseudo random property. So it will connect the uh, two parts of the talk this way. So I want to talk about one more pseudo random property. Uh, you know, uh, it's a property of tables of matrices of numbers. Okay, so think of a, uh, a random and by n matrix with entries uh, in M. Think we are working more more than uh, you know, or elements between one and n. Okay, and what when do I call? Uh, you know, what's the property I'm after? The property is that if I look at any submatrix, small submatrix, okay, uh, then I see lots of numbers. So let's quantify this. Yeah, this is certainly the, you know, what you will see in, uh, you know, in, in such random examples. Uh, every small window, which is a submatrix, submatrix I mean in general, it's subset of rows cross a subset of columns. Uh, let's say, you know, if I pick a K by K window, K rows and K columns, and I look at this K squared entries, I see significantly more than K distinct entries. I mean, you would expect actually it will be close to K squared if K is small enough, and K is small enough, K is maybe n to the point one. So in a random table, you know, surely you will have this property for every window. I want to stress, I want for every window. Uh, it's a pseudo random property. It's, a, it's an easy theorem counting argument to, to prove that uh, a random matrix will have this property. And uh, here's a question uh, of the same nature Can such matrices be constructed explicitly? Is there, is there you know, just give me a matrix of numbers in uh, one through n by n matrix, where, of course, the family of matrices so that every uh, k by k window has at least k to the 1.1 distinct entries, say. Uh, okay, I mean, the, you should, I mean the, we mathematicians have lots of examples for the matrices we like that look random in various ways, but I mean, let's start from, uh, you know, every kid could give you a matrix, right? I mean, uh, second grader can give you the addition table. Say so here's the here's the matrix. Let's say we wrap more than uh, the numbers. I didn't do it here, but uh, we wrap the numbers more than. Uh, is it good? Is this pseudo random in this sense? Does every small window have few entries? Well, of course not. I mean, <laughs> we've seen in in if we look along uh, an arithmetic progression uh, in rows and columns, we will see just a linear number. Uh, in uh, K by K matrix, we'll see just a linear number of distinct entries. So it's certainly bad. Uh, okay, 
well, we can go to third grade and think about the multiplication table. Uh, and uh, we can ask whether this is good. And of course, the answer is uh, no for the same reason. If we look at the, well, this uh, uh, rectangle doesn't show it. But if you look at the geometric progression uh, along rows and columns, again, you'll see only a linear number of entries. And uh, this uh, somehow reminds me of a lesson that uh, von Neumann uh, was saying or attributed to von Neumann that anyone who considers arithmetical method to produce random digits is, of course, in a state of sin. But uh, anybody who knows the history knows that uh, von Neumann ignored his own advice and, of course, used pseudo-random generators based on arithmetical means. And uh, in fact, you should do it in this case too. And what I'm going to say is the result that probably many of you are familiar with, uh, is that uh, while each of these tables, each of these matrices, the addition one, the multiplication one is bad, their combination is good. Uh, starting with other similarity in the case of integers and then Bougain cut style in the final field case, let's say mod, mod n or mod p. Uh, if you do it mod the prime, then every window will be good in one of these tables. So if you look at the union of numbers you see in the, you know, in the window above and window below, there'll be plenty of entries, as, much, as many as you, as you need. So what does it mean in terms of, so first of all, we found, uh, you know, by cheating a bit, by taking two tables, we found, uh, elements that have this pseudo-random property, which are explicit. In fact, they are very simple and easy to compute. And uh, this, is, uh, this was used in one of the early solutions to the, this problem of extractor randomness. Um, yeah. Basically, sum and products are independent. That's the message from this uh, very important theorem. And uh, mixing them increases entropy. So one way to view this extractor um, uh, is that uh, if you have three such sources, uh, you can uh, add the first two and multiply by the third. You know, they think of them as integers mod p. The entropy, uh, total entropy, will have increased. You know, the entropy rate uh, uh, will have increased, and therefore you can repeat it several times and approach, uh, you know, perfect randomness. So that's one example of an extractor using this particular pseudo-random property of tables of matrices. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. Uh, some things we have seen, uh, some important messages. Uh, I want to go back to this uh, really important point that uh, you know randomness is in the eye of the beholder or in the computational power of the beholder. This is a subjective definition and this uh, uh, very important point of view that leads to this uh, understanding. It's also pragmatic in, in the sense that uh, you can study the use of the um, of randomness uh, or the intended use of randomness and maybe by understanding it you can uh, you know remove the use of uh, randomness in it uh, and uh, the impact of uh, this kind of point of view is that uh, you can remove randomness from probabilistic algorithms, uh, even in situations where you have very weak random sources, or even assuming hardness uh, in a world which is just purely deterministic. I should maybe add here that uh, because you are familiar with this example, but may not be familiar with the, you know, the uh, how related it is to the lecture. So you all know that there is a deterministic polynomial time algorithm to uh, certify primes to determine whether a number an integer is prime or not. Uh, um, you also probably know that uh, there are lots of probabilistic algorithms for this before the deterministic one was known. And of course, the question of uh, doing this sufficiently uh, is, is extremely old. Gauss talks about it quite explicitly. Uh, Andrew Granville has a beautiful survey in which uh, he cites in the beginning this uh, excerpt from uh, Gauss's description uh, Arithmetica, uh, where he basically calls uh, 
to the community. He basically says it's a disgrace. We don't yet have an efficient algorithm for either primality or factoring. Anyway, uh, the way what what uh, I think less people know is that uh, the way that the deterministic al uh, algorithm was obtained by Agarwal Kayal, uh, Agarwal Kayal and Saxena was the following. They've designed a new probabilistic algorithm for primality testing. And then, in fact, this was earlier work of uh, uh, Agarwal and, uh, and other students. Um, and the work was uh, of Agarwal Kayal and Saxena is a de-randomization of this algorithm. It's a way of understanding the way the algorithm used this randomness and constructing a specific pseudo-random generator which fools it and therefore makes it deterministic. Okay, so anyway, uh, there are many uh, other probabilistic algorithms we, for which we know it only uh, under you know, assum assumptions like p different uh, next to the randomness, so what what was used is the you know uh, the general very high level definition of uh, uh, pseudo randomness, uh, which connects basically the like in the example of primality, connects the property uh, the pseudo random property with the application in mind, the, maybe the algorithm you want to de randomize. Uh, the study of pseudo randomness captures many basic problems and areas, both in math and in computer science, I could have talked another hour on uh, you know structure versus randomness paradigm, which is very much part of uh, uh, pseudo randomness study. Uh, um, you know, it captures things like uh, some. Uh, uh, this name I think was given by Tao, who gave uh, surveys of examples like this, and you know many like some of the regularity lemma, uh, or it's used in uh, arithmetic progressions in the primes. It's used in boosting in machine learning and it's used uh, basically uh, the other applications of it in uh, um, in analysis and PDEs and uh, you know lots of uh, definitely in uh, in uh, number theory uh, and uh, uh, yeah so it's it's it stems from a very uh, you know pseudo randomness uh, like approach to uh, a, a very wide array of problems and the last thing is that uh, pseudo random objects that you you build for particular purposes in particular uh, you know extractor for extractor theory or expander graphs or various codes or something uh, uh, turn out to actually they were initially designed for fault tolerant circuits uh, or that's at least what Pinsker had in mind as an application uh, Often they find many, many, many more applications than uh, they used to. They are they somehow fundamental. Turn out many of them are fundamental in uh, other contexts. The new, uh, you know, uh, thing you must have heard of is high dimensional expanders, another example of a pseudo random object of a mysterious nature that we are trying to understand. And uh, yeah, there are many more. So let me end with this. Thank you. <laughs>